Welcome to the 2021 Minneapolis mayoral debate hosted by WCCO4 News. The leading candidates are weighing in on important questions that will affect our city for years to come. Let's go now to our hosts live at WCCO Studios in downtown Minneapolis. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Esme Murphy. Welcome to a Minneapolis mayoral debate with WCCO TV and streaming on CBS and Minnesota. We are live as we speak on Monday afternoon, just over a week before next Tuesday's big election. I'm joined by my colleagues and debate moderators, of course, Red Chapman and Caroline Cummings. There are more than a dozen candidates who said they'd like to be the next mayor of the city. WCCO has invited four top contenders to be part of what we hope will be a lively and informative discussion. We welcome Welcome incumbent Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry, community organizer Sheila Najad, former state representative Kate Knuth, and court mediator A.J. Awed. Thank you all for being with us on CBSN Minnesota. We want you, our viewers, to know that no candidate has been given, uh, given the questions in advance. We are about to ask, uh, and we will work hard in this next hour to give everyone a fair chance to speak to important topics. To help do that, our producers generated a random order of the four candidates to get started. We'll have then the candidates take turns answering questions throughout the debate. My candidates, since you are each joining from a web camera, we ask that you please stick to the time we ask. We'll let you know when time is about up. And please do not speak over top of another candidate who is trying to answer a question. If someone refers to you and your record directly, we will give you some additional time to respond after each candidate has answered each question. Now, let's get started. We begin with the question of public safety, largely driven by the police murder of George Floyd. It's widely considered to be the most important and controversial issue on the ballot. Listed as question two on the ballot, it asks if the Minneapolis City Charter should be amended to remove the police department and replace it with a Department of Public Safety that, quote, employs a comprehensive public health approach. This question has been the subject of several court challenges and challenges in wording. Each candidate will get a chance on this, but to kick things off, we're asking for a yes or no answer answer only when then we'll, I'll, we'll ask a follow-up right after that for each of you so yes or no we'll begin with Sheila Nazad do you support this charter amendment to replace the MPD with the Department of Public Safety yes I do all right Kate Knuth yes or no on question two yes and Mayor Fry yes or no no and Mr. Awad yes or no no okay. Now for the follow-ups, Sheila Najad, you, in May you told the hosts of the podcast Wedge Live that after George Floyd's death, you were <coughs> present the night of one of the most violent protests. You said you actually were shot by police and that you knew that you and the people you were with were breaking the law by violating curfew. You added that the number one thing that should have been done that night was to provide the protesters with, quote, hot food and bathrooms. Is this what you would do as mayor? I think actually what I said was talking about what would be my response in times of protest like that those many days. And I said that from you, the you, outset, so I, I actually have the, trans, uh, the transcript right here. You said, number one, bathrooms and hot food. Yeah, yeah. So the, the question was, what would your response be to protests? And my response is compassion for folks who are grieving. So at spots where folks were gathering from the beginning, providing hot food and bathrooms, because that's what you do when someone passes away, is you provide hot food. And if you want to de-escalate a gathering, make sure people have a place to go <laughs> to the bathroom. And that's, that's how we create spaces where people can grieve together, right? I would also provide free counseling in park buildings and schools across the city all right, thank you so much, Mr. Jad. Najad, Ms. Knuth, in 2012, as a state legislator from New Brighton, you voted to eliminate the civilian re review of the Minneapolis Police Department. Isn't that completely inconsistent with your support of Charter Amendment 2, which would put any police or Department of Public Safety under civilian leadership? You have one minute to respond. You know, my goal as a public leader is to take on challenges that are at the center of what we're dealing with. And in 2012, it was clear the civilian review process of police oversight was broken. And I, like so many of my colleagues of the legislature, decided to dig in and try to do something better. Nine years later, here we are, it hasn't gotten better. And under Mayor Fry's leadership, it's actually gotten worse. And so I have put forward a bold, courageous plan to transform policing 
and build community safety. And I think Minneapolis voters should really be focused on the record of the last four years and especially the last year and a half where Mayor Fry has literally seen officers hunting people in our city and has not yet created accountability within the MPD. That's something that is not acceptable for Minneapolis voters. And I think we absolutely need to dig in and change. Mayor Fry, in a debate four years ago, you made the case against re-electing the incumbent mayor, Betsy Hodges, for these reasons, and this is a quote. Over the past several years, we've had a 200% increase in violent crimes. Specifically, we've had some of the worst police community relations in a long time. That was in 2017, what you said. Couldn't that same argument be made against your re-election? You have one minute. I think the history speaks for itself. Uh, we did have two years of unprecedented progress when I took office. And yes, the last two years have been unprecedented. They've been unpredictable and whatever other superlative that you want to attach. Uh, and through it all, you know, we've told the truth. We've charted an honest and clear path for the city. And the truth is, that, as mayor, you also need to make very hard and at times painful decisions. Uh, our position has been consistent throughout on this item of public safety. I favor a both end approach, which means yes, deep seated accountability. Yes, a full structure change, uh, safety beyond policing. And importantly, we also need police. Uh, and right now we have fewer officers per capita than just about any major city in the entire country. Chief Arredondo and I have been working lockstep to make sure that we're tackling this extremely important issue right now. And Mr. Awed, you are against Charter Amendment 2, but last year when you were running for Minneapolis City Council, you ran on a platform of abolishing the Minneapolis Police Department. Should voters trust someone whose position changed so dramatically in just a year? You have 60 seconds. Yeah, um, I think the voters should definitely trust me because I've been consistent throughout my campaign and throughout last year's election. Um, with regards to last year, if anybody follows that thread, um, I was also making the recommendation and advocating for community engagement. Um, and for me, when I talk about abolishing the MPD, which uh, I think my counterparts that are supporting Yes for Minneapolis right now are doing, we do want a new Department of Public Safety. I think that is common sense for everybody in the city of Minneapolis. But how we get there is very, very important. And for me, I'm the only person in this race that's trying to bring people back to the, the point that we started, whereas communities of color really do need their voices heard in this important moment. And I think that this civil rights moment is really calling for leadership to be consistent on who they're trying to represent in power. So for me, I would not say that that's inconsistency. I would say that is extreme consistency. How is it possibly consistent to call for abolishing the police a year ago and support Charter Amendment or be against Charter Amendment 2. They're exact opposites. No, I mean, if you listen carefully, I'm, I'm saying that the new Department of Public Safety needs to happen. But what I'm saying is this path that we're going through right now that is mirrored in uncertainties and that for me and the major elephant in the room for me is community of color's voices are not being centered, then in good conscience, I could not support that. That's having a new container that's completely empty. So for me, I'm looking forward to being the next mayor of Minneapolis that can get us through this tough time that actually builds trust in a new Department of Public Safety. I'm not hearing that from my other counterparts. All right, let me ask a quick uh, follow-up of Sheila Najad. You mentioned the need for more compassion, and I think everybody would agree compassion is sorely needed in this day and age. But compassion to these protesters, 1,500 Minnesota businesses were destroyed in these protests. Uh, uh, by one estimate, just 21% are back up and running. Is compassion the real answer in the face of such destruction? I do have serious concerns about the hundreds of residents who were hunted by the Minneapolis police. And those, those are the words of the Minneapolis police. We have to remember that. I, I'm People talking about the protests, though. Eyes. Sorry? I'm talking about the response to the protests, because you've been very critical of Mayor Fry's response to the protest. Right. I, this is during, during the protest response, right? They admitted that they were hunting down protesters, that they were targeting groups of folks on the street. People lost their eyes. People got concussions. Someone died just last month because of long-term impacts after being hit by a rubber bullet by the MPD. And 
that was the role of the mayor was to make sure that that violence was not happening. We didn't see that leadership. Mr. Mayor, I'll give you uh, 30 seconds to respond. Yeah, what we saw last summer was unprecedented in every form. It is true that there were so many people that were out there peacefully protesting, and I respect that. But let's also be real. There were people that were violent as well. And some of the circumstances that we saw uh, required that we had the necessary law enforcement present, whether that was from our police, the National Guard, or the State Patrol mm -hmm. that could quell the unrest and burning businesses that they're seeing. I understand fully that people are not comfortable with the presence of National Guard or State Patrol on the streets. It doesn't make me comfortable either. Uh, but what's also uncomfortable is the reality of a commercial corridor burning down. Uh, as mayor, you need to make these painful decisions at times. And the we, every single step of the way, we did chart that honest course. These were very, very tough times. And we've Mr. led Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry, we, we have to move on to our next question and my colleague, Caroline Cummings. Let's move on to this so-called strong mayor ballot question. This is perhaps one of the lesser known proposals before Minneapolis voters. It would change the city's form of government and clearly define the mayor as the city's chief executive and the city council as the legislative and policy making body. The executive committee that oversees city department heads would be eliminated. We'll start with Kate Knuth this time. Please answer just yes or no to start. Do you support charter amendment number one? No. Mayor Fry, yes or no, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, AJ Awed, yes or no? Yes. And Sheila Najad, how do you vote, yes or no? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kate Knuth, you said no. The city of St. Paul has a similar structure as the proposal in the language, and the executive legislative model exists at the state and federal level. Why shouldn't Minneapolis do the same? You know, I am not convinced Minneapolis needs a strong mayor ch uh, charter amendment. I am absolutely convinced that we need stronger more effective leadership in the office of the mayor itself. And over the last four years, we haven't had it, especially over the last 18 months. And we have felt what it feels like to not have strong mayoral leadership while we are going through crisis. And it feels lousy. It leaves us swirling. It leaves us divided and fearful. And I think Minneapolis residents are united in our path forward to move beyond the status quo of public safety and policing. And one of the most foundational things we need to do in that work is build trust across the geography, across lines of race and generation, and putting more power in the hands of the mayor at this crucial moment, I think undermines our ability to do that. Mayor Fry, you said you support question one, and in a charter commission report summarizing interviews with city department heads, some of those officials positively described the current structure as requiring collaboration and compromise between the mayor and the council. How do you maintain that with having more executive authority under this plan? Well, the vast majority of department heads that were interviewed during that very process you brought up talked about the system being disjointed. They talked about it lacking clarity. And they talked about being told what to do by 14 different people at the same time. That is a structure that simply doesn't work. Now, some mayors going all the way back to Hubert Humphrey have argued in a change in our system to allow for a clear executive in the mayor that would control day-to-day -day functions, a clear legislative branch in the city council that would deliberate, listen to experts and data, do constituent services and pass laws. But the system that we have is gray and as, am, and as <coughs> ambiguous. And has been, as has been noted, uh, mid and large cities throughout the country have a system that works. St. Paul has a clear executive in the mayor. We do not, and it leads to disjoint. Let's pass uh, a charter amendment that at the very least provides clarity to both residents and department heads throughout our city. Mr. Awed, I'll pose the same question to you. How would you maintain collaboration between the mayor's office and city council should question one, which you support, pass? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think a uh, strong mayor, uh, in line with the traditional role of all mayors throughout this country's job, is to build great working partnerships with the city council. But as the mayor said, the city council is a legislative body, um, and that is just not the precedence and how they operate in the city right now. And for me, I think this is a little bit more personal to me, as I understand that the racial disparities in the city are the worst, second worst in this country. And I think there's a fair argument to make that if you really do want to have these equities addressed in a meaningful way, that we do need to depart from this, I think, archaic structure that is an experimentation for all intended purposes throughout this country. And for me, I'm looking to do that work, and I cannot do that work in the in the current structure. I want to be able to be a voice for communities of color in the broader city at large. I want to be able to do and advance those things that everybody's promoting, but the current structure just does not allow for that. And finally, Ms. Najad, since you said no, please again explain why Minneapolis should keep its current form of government when other cities in Minnesota and the state and federal government mirror this executive legislative approach detailed in the ballot question. Thank you. I'm voting no because I have serious equity concerns about voter representation between citywide votes in different parts of the city, there are huge disparities in voter turnout in who elects the mayor. I do agree, however, that there is a problem to be solved. And as mayor, I would invest more in constituent services at the ward level to be able to provide equitable service and make sure that department staff can stay on the work of their departments. All right, thank you very much. Now on to our next question from my colleague, Reg. Minneapolis has never implemented a rent control ordinance, but ballot question number three could change that. It would amend the city charter to authorize the city council to regulate rent on private residential property. We'll begin this part with Mayor Jacob Fry to start. We're looking for just a yes or no answer, please. Do you support the ballot question number three on rent control, yes or no? Yes. AJ, AJ Awad, yes or no on ballot question number three? Yes, sir. Sheila Najad, yes or no? Yes. Kate Knut, yes or no? Yes. Mayor Fry, please explain your answer on rent control in 60 seconds. I do not support rent control in its classic form. Uh, however, I do support local control, which is the ability of municipalities, cities just like Minneapolis to have a legislative process where the city council deliberates, they engage with experts, they follow the data, they talk to a broad subset of the community to learn about all of the stakeholders' positions, and then they pass laws. Now, that is different than supporting rent control. That is supporting the process, but not the substance. Uh, rent control has been found by almost every major economist out there to have the exact opposite impact as stabilizing the rents. We need to be listening to experts. We need to be listening to data. And that is exactly the process that I would support going forward. But will I support the ultimate ordinance a city council may or may not come forward with? I don't know. We haven't read it yet. Thank you, Mayor Fry. AJ Oed, explain your answer in 60 seconds, please. Yeah, so for me, this is a very simple answer. Um, this is a fundamental human right. I think all the contenders here on this uh, platform understand that and believe that. And for me, I think this is a tool that calls for that type of regulation. Uh, I think the rate of homelessness in the city is going up mainly because of the, of the re, uh, increases in rent. And I think as far as... Um, this current amendment, I'm, I'm actually in support of actually the people putting it up. And I think there might be some you know, uh, legislate, uh, uh, I would say legal battles between if the city council even has the authority to do that right now. But uh, for me, I think that we do need to have a substantive rent control policy, better actually known as rent stabilization in the city of Minneapolis. If we believe that is a fundamental human right, then I think to regulate the, the housing market in such a way is not only necessary, but I think common sense. Uh, and the, as far as the economics and, and, and the experts, those are when developers go into backdoor rooms and have a lot of exceptions, which I think we should not do. Thank you, Mr. Awed. Sheila Najad, explain your answer in 60 seconds, please. Absolutely. So if you look around four years ago to now, 
can see that Minneapolis's housing crisis has gotten worse, not better. Over half the people in Minneapolis are renters, and I'm one of them. I've been a renter my entire time in Minneapolis, and I know what it feels like to have the squeeze of finding an apartment that you can afford here. And, and rent control provides us the opportunity to make sure that everyone can afford to live in Minneapolis. And our, our neighbor, St. Paul, their mayor recently came out in support of their rent control policy. And I do support a 3% or tied to inflation policy. And, and as mayor, I would be happy to implement that in addition to implementing stronger tenant protections and education for renters. So they make sure that they know their rights and predatory landlords are not a, able to exploit tenants. Thank you, Ms. Nazad. And finally, former Representative Kate Knute, explain your answer in 60 seconds, please. Yeah, I think rent stabilization is an important part of a more holistic approach to taking on the housing crisis in Minneapolis head on. You know, it's disappointing that the mayor said he'd look at what the city council passed and decide yes or no. Part of the mayor's job is to help set an agenda and a vision and a path forward. And we really haven't seen that from the current mayor. When it comes to rent stabilization, the design for the policy that I support and would champion is making sure we're, present, uh, we're protecting renters, we're protecting small landlords, we're making sure we're not slowing down building more housing in the city, and that we're not concerned about pushing out big national capital money interests that are just trying to make money on housing in our city and not concerned about safety and stability in our neighborhoods. Thank you all very much. Now on to our next question. Let's talk more about crime in the city. There's no debate. Crime is on the rise. We are currently on pace to surpass our previous record of 97 homicides in a year set to 1995. In my neighborhood, in North Minneapolis, shootings are a regular occurrence, and I've seen firsthand the impact violence has on our citizens. Mr. A.J. Oed, on your website, you've blamed Mayor Fry for the rise in crime. You have laid out online a long-term strategy to fight crime. But what is your plan to make the city safer immediately? You have one minute. Well, I mean, all the literature and all the evidence-based practices points that we need to have more recruitment and rank and file officers on patrols. Uh, that is the biggest deterrent to gun violence, robberies, burglaries, rapes, and murders. Um, so for me, the first priority for the next mayor, any mayor, should be getting more officers out on the streets. Uh, and that's exactly what I plan to do. And the reason why I think I'm the best person suited to do that job is because I think I have the credibility in communities of color to really have them be empowered to raise their hands. Uh, also really enlist people to you know be in service for community uh, that has to be led by a mayor that has competent community connections i would say cultural competencies uh, and for me we cannot have mayor fry come back because from all accounts the rank and file uh do not have confidence and that is one of the factors leading to the high levels of attrition in the city of minneapolis so to me i think we need to all get to understand that officers need to be hired and recruited and we need to create an environment that actually welcomes good officers. Uh, now, the long-term approaches are totally different than that. I think that has to do with trust. That has to do with making sure communities of color actually validate the system that we are going to embark on. And if we don't do those two things with a two-step two approach, I think that whatever we do is just going to be in just, I would say, disappointment. Thank you, Mr. Owen. So, thank you. Thank you. Sheila Nazad, your discussion about getting rid of the police department has given you a national profile. As you know, three children were shot in North Minneapolis this past summer. People are afraid. What do you tell families who have experienced violence firsthand and are afraid of losing an already diminished police force? You have one minute to answer. Absolutely. Everyone in Minneapolis deserves to feel safe, and that's why we need solutions. And when we look at gun violence, who's being impacted by gun violence, we need to look at supporting our youth, especially. Youth have been hardest hit by the pandemic, hardest hit by the rising crime. Schools were closed for a year. Park buildings, many of them still closed. Parents, families stressed out during the pandemic. And youth, when we look also at property crime, a lot of it is being done by young teens and there's nowhere else they're supposed to be. So as mayor, I would invest in emergency deployment of youth jobs and youth programming across the city for the cost that we spent on helicopters last summer to fly around my neighborhood off Lake Street to try to find 
people who were stealing cars. Imagine how many young people we could have given jobs with that money and how much crime that would have prevented. Thank you. Kate Knuth, you're also called for a different model for policing in the city. Police Chief Madaria Arredondo said last week that the department has lost more than 200 officers since 2019. How do you attract public safety officials who actually want to stay on the job? You have one minute. Yeah, I really appreciate this question because we often talk about the number of police officers as our approach to safety. I want to make sure we in Minneapolis know that building safety takes investing in prevention and in violence interruption as well as economic security. But we can talk about the numbers here. We are down so many officers under the mismanagement of Jacob Fry of our police department. He has full authority and we're not we're not down because city council has cut funding. We're down because officers have left. So how do we attract officers who want to serve the city of Minneapolis effectively and in partnership and in collaboration. We need to make sure we're prioritizing paying them well. We need to make sure we're not asking them to do things they're not trained for. And we need to make sure that, yes, they are going to be held accountable as part of building trust between our community and officers in the city of Minneapolis. Thank you very much, Ms. Knuth. Now, mayor Fry, on your website, you have a long list of reforms that you've achieved as mayor. However, there is also a long list of senseless acts of violence that have happened during your tenure. Many crimes are unsolved. As the ultimate leader of the police department, are you doing enough to ensure that justice will be served for these families? You have one minute, sir. These aren't just statistics for me. These are late night conversations that I have with our chief. These are countless visits to the hospital to talk to parents that are grieving because they just lost a son or a daughter. This hits home because it's real. And these conversations, they aren't covered by the news. You don't put them out on social media. Uh, these are the real life impacts of crime and violence in our city. And you need real life solutions. And so unlike others, I have never supported defunding or abolishing the police. My position has been consistent throughout in that we need a both end approach. We've asked for five additional recruiting classes for this next year. We've requested additional mutual aid assistance, cameras for hotspots, as well as overtime to deal with some of the attrition that we've seen. Uh, and as mayor, you're bound to get hit from every single side. We've got some that will say that I'm not close enough with police officers, other that'll say that I'm far too close with them, regardless. You need to take an honest and consistent approach throughout, and that is exactly what we've done through, through some of the most trying times our city has ever experienced. Just a quick follow-up question. Most of the crime that is happening, we're talking about, is happening in North Minneapolis. Many North Minneapolis residents feel as if they are not being heard. Have any of you ridden with police to do a ride along on the north side, and have you talked to people on the north side about their fears about the sound of automatic gunfire constantly throughout the night and sometimes during the day? Do you have that in your context? Have you spoken to these people and have you taken a ride with MPD? Let's start first with uh, Ms. Najet. Najat, excuse yes. me. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I have. My campaign has been focusing on hearing directly from people. We spent a lot of resources on door knocking and we door knocked every single voting precinct in wards four and five, talking to thousands of people and hearing their concerns and really listening to the desire for solutions and desire for investment. Right? And again, what I heard from folks, no matter where they stood on policing, was a real need for investment in young people, in youth jobs, in youth programming, and especially in youth housing. Because right now, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds can't afford to rent anywhere in Minneapolis. Thank you. Mr. Awed, your answer to that question. Yeah, thank you for that question. And I think actually it highlights the nuance because I was, I had the, the fortune to ride, on the, ride around in the fifth precinct, but I was a participant in a, in a gun violence, stop the gun violence rally held by some neighborhood leaders. Um, and I would say North side leaders, Crystal Porter was running for Ward 5 and the Kima was amongst them. Uh, and it was shocking to see how small the footprint is, right? It's mostly black leaders, black youth out there saying we need the gun stop, the gun violence to stop and we need to address it in the right way. I don't see my, my progressive allies that were out there 
um, the, through the murder of George Floyd, uh, really showing that level of consistency when it comes to black lives. So for me, I do have that in my head and it's gonna be guiding me to make sure that community's voices are centered throughout my administration. Thank you, Mr. Awed. Ms. Knuth, your answer. Absolutely. My campaign and I have been connecting with Northside residents on the doors, at meet and greets, at community events. It is essential to listen to and deeply um, feel the impact of gun violence in communities. So it is unacceptable for children to be shot and killed in our community. And it's unacceptable for police to kill people in our community. And I think we don't have to choose between uh, public safety and racial justice. And we absolutely can't turn a path forward that forces us to choose. You know, I have done a ride along with Hennepin County EMS. I'm trying to fully understand the holistic approach we can take to public safety and our EMS and mental health response are absolute essential partners in that work. Thank you, Ms. Knute. Mayor Fry, your answer, please. Yes, I've done a ride along, uh, but perhaps more importantly, when I took office, I made a specific intention to be on the north side more than any other area in the entire city, other than, of course, where I live and work. Uh, and what we found in talking to people is that they want to be able to send their kids out to jump on a trampoline or walk on the sidewalk or play a game of basketball without the risk of getting hit by gun violence. We worked directly with 21 Days of Peace, and I took up an intersection myself uh, to make sure that community members feel heard. Uh, and frequently we head over to the north side just to hear from constituents on what they're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. Every person in every neighborhood deserves to feel safe. And when you have around 90% of the gun violence located in five neighborhoods throughout the city, that is just unacceptable. And we need to be clear-eyed about the solutions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, everyone. Now to our next question from my colleague, Caroline Cummings. Downtown Minneapolis is still struggling to bounce back from the unrest and the pandemic that's dictated the last 18 months here. And the downtown council says workers in the workers in office, restaurant diners, hotel occupancy are all less than half the levels seen before the pandemic began, really in March 2020. This as crime is on the rise. Sheila Nazad. Let's start with you. Why should people visit downtown Minneapolis right now? And what would you do to reinvigorate the downtown landscape? You have one minute to answer. Yes, I think that we need to make downtown a place that everyone wants to be and have things that everyone can afford to do. And that's why as mayor, I would support more free public programming, things to do downtown, art shows, concerts, things that provide activities for our families. And after they go to that concert, maybe they'll go to a restaurant downtown. Maybe they'll go catch a show at First Avenue. These are the ways that we're gonna help reinvigorate downtown in a way that really starts with the people too. And, and it is available to working class folks who are all over the city wanting to come together. And I will also work with the businesses of downtown to figure out what does is, what is post-pandemic business look like? What supports do we need from the city to move towards more cooperative models, to move towards hybrid, virtual, and in-person? All of these are ways that we can rebuild downtown together in a way that is fun and safe and prosperous. Ms. Knuth, the same question to you in one minute, please. Why should people visit downtown and what as mayor would you do to, to bring it back? Yeah, so just last week, I released my economic vitality plan. It includes an explicit section about downtown. Downtown is an essential part of the dynamism and the success of Minneapolis and frankly, the state of Minnesota overall. We are coming through a pandemic. And at this point in our city's history, it is important for the mayor to not have every answer. I think anyone who says they have every answer in downtown is not being honest with you, but to lead the work together with the downtown council, with the downtown workers council, with residents, with business owners, with service providers and cultural organizations to come together to create the programming, the investment and the economic opportunity to make sure our downtown, we don't leave it behind, we don't forget about it, but we absolutely make it an important central part of who we are as Minneapolis and the state of Minnesota overall. Mayor Fry, the same question to you. You have one minute, please. 
as mayor, it's not good enough to just say we need to come together. As mayor, you need to make decisions and at times painful ones. Uh, and it's no secret to anyone, we've had a global pandemic over this last year and a half. And, you know, I stand by the decision to be the first city in the state to institute a mask mandate, the first city in the state to close down bars and restaurants. Why? Because it was going to save lives. And at the same time, we need to reignite our downtown because our entire city depends on it. You will not have a world class city without a world class downtown. And you will not have a world class downtown unless it's safe and people feel safe. Both the reality and the perception of safety needs to be there. I'll also note the importance of downtown is critical because other social services depend on the property taxes that come from some of those large buildings. You need to provide affordable housing. You need to provide the necessary social service, and that requires a successful downtown. So, of course, we need to listen to the epidemiologists, but we need to lock arms and reignite our city's economy. Mr. Awed, please answer in 60 seconds. What would you want to do as mayor to bring downtown Minneapolis back? Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, I'm of East African origin, so business is something that really drives our community and our culture. Uh, and to that point, I mean, downtown is really the engine for the city's tax base. Um, we do need to be creative in how we actually make sure that we diversify it. I and mean, there's a lot of vacant you know, property that's going to be there. How do we, you know, you know, make bridges between that? How do we make sure to bring and champion great events? I think all of these things matter and who that person, the messenger matters in that. I'm a great, I would say, person that wants to act to champion the city of Minneapolis in its downtown core, make sure that it's accessible for traffic, make sure that it's beautiful, actually make the proper investments, that the aesthetics are good. That means trees, trees, trees. Uh, for me, I'm thinking about it as, as a way to highlight our cultural diversity in the city of Minneapolis. And I don't think that should be just relegated to Lake Street, but we should bring that diversity downtown a little bit more in a visible way. We have an opportunity to do that. And with my leadership, hopefully, I think I can I can bridge those gaps in different culture, hopefully, to, to make our city more beautiful and inclusive. A quick follow up here, Mayor Fry, you mentioned um, how social services depend on downtown property taxes. Obviously, the pandemic has changed the way we work. Many people working from home and not using perhaps office spaces that they once were familiar with every single day. So given that changing landscape, I'm going to give you uh, for each 30 seconds to just um, respond how you would adapt to that kind of changing uh, work work environment for many of the offices downtown. Mayor Fry. To a certain extent, this concept of remote working uh, was inevitable, but I think it was expedited probably five to eight years by COVID-19. That being said, I do think that our downtown will come back in fine form. And by the way, we are ahead of several other cities of comparable size towards that end. Now, at the same time, I think we do have to reinvent how we use a number of different spaces, whether that's commercial, making sure it's more cooperative oriented rather than office or it's retail, making sure that we're serving small and local businesses throughout our city. We can't be afraid to take the next step in where our economy is going right now. Uh, and we've been reaching out to business owners and workers alike to make sure we're heading right there. Thank you, Mayor Fry. Uh, Sheila Najad, please uh, give your answer to that question. How do you adapt to changing uh, work environments? Absolutely. So I think that we need to hear from people in Minneapolis about what they need right now. While big corporations have moved more towards hybrid models, I do hear a lot of desire for co-working spaces. Some folks, they're zoomed out, they're ready to be in person. So some of these spaces, we might shift to more co-working models, more cooperative models, and also putting in community centers and youth centers downtown. So again, we bring people together so that they can enjoy our downtown and help rebuild it. Ms. Knuth, your answer, please. Yeah, I think we need to make a downtown that's dynamic coming out of the pandemic. And that involves recognizing that it's not gonna be the same kind of work environment going forward. And that's okay. You know, downtown doesn't look the way it what did 10 years ago. I don't live downtown, but I grocery shop down there almost every week. I go to Target downtown. And when I've been out listening to downtown residents, to downtown business owners, what I hear is a need on focus, a focus on safety, 
and dynamic activities and making sure we're partnering with the many different groups and users that are part of making our downtown a success. Mr. Awed, your answer, please. I am so sorry. I apologize. Um, but what I was going to say was, yeah, so I mean, in terms of investments within our BIPOC community, really being able to open those shop fronts. But as this, you know, as this change happens, I think we also need to be cautious of how to unlock the potential of our BIPOC businesses and really making sure to have them as industry leaders. I think there's great potential there. Uh, but uh, for me, I think we can, we have a lot of potential to make sure to have cultural uh, exchanges and, and, and we have the proper investments in apartments and small businesses. All right, thank you all for your questions. We're going to shift gears a little bit and go to a lightning round, a little lighter side questions. Uh, we'll ask you each to try and keep your answers to 15 seconds. We'll start with Kate Knuth this time. Each of you will get the same question. And the first question is, we assume each of you will vote for yourself in the city's ranked choice voting. In 15 seconds, who would you rank second and third and why? You know, last week, Sheila Najad and I um, helped bring ranked choice voting clarity to our supporters. And we're both planning to rank each other um, second after voting for ourselves first. And I want to also encourage people to clearly rank a third choice in their ballot. And I think Mayor Fry has not earned a second term. All right. Kate Knuth, uh, thank you so much for your answer. Let's go to Mayor Fry. Thank you. Like uh, many Minneapolis residents throughout the city, I'm still evaluating my second and third choices, uh, so I have not made that decision yet. You've had a lot of time to evaluate the second and third choices. No second or third choices yet? No, nope, not yet. Uh, but certainly I'll be making those prior to my visit to the ballot box. Very well. All right, Mr. Awed, who are your second and third choices? <laughs> uh, I think I've already been on the record to say that, you know, I could in good and conscience probably rank others. Um, and uh, along the same lines as uh, Mayor Fry, um, I haven't really decided yet, um, but I'm pretty confident that I'm probably going to rank all myself one on, on the ballot there. All right, thank you so much. And Sheila Najad, the same question for you. Who would you rank second and third? Absolutely, thanks for this question. I'm a coalition builder, so I have been thinking about this for a long time, and I'm ranking Kate Knuth second, and I encourage my supporters to do the same and look for a consistent candidate who's been um, in this for a while for your third place. Encourage everyone to do their research, and remember that you can vote all across the board. All right, thank you very much for that answer. All right, we're going to our second question. What is your favorite Minneapolis park outside of your own neighborhood and why? Let's start with Kate Knuth again. Oh, this is such a great question. We have so many great parks. You know, I love um, to be along the river. I used to live near the river. I don't live there anymore. I live over in Bryn Mawr and I love to just walk and ride along the river that makes us such a dynamic, beautiful place to live. Mayor Fry. My favorite continues to be the Mississippi Riverfront, uh, and obviously that stretches through a number of different neighborhoods through our city. Uh, it's a national park. It, it is recognized worldwide, uh, and I just love to go for a run along the shores. And Mr. Awed, what is your favorite park outside of your own neighborhood? Uh, I would probably have to say, to get a sense of home, I love going to Curry Park. Um, it's always uh, great nostalgia there. Um, so I would probably say Curry Park. All right, thank you for that answer. And Sheila Najad, your favorite park outside of your own neighborhood? This is an easy one for me. Falwell Park on the north side. You've got a great playground, you've got a splash pool, you've got great trees. I love it there. All right, thank you so much. Now go, we'll go to our third question. What is your favorite sculpture at the Walker Minneapolis Sculpture Garden? Kate Knuth. Oh, this is such a great question. My daughter, the sculpture garden is in between our home and where our daughter goes to school. And so um, it's actually kind of one of her playgrounds. And 
I um, I love a lot of the sculptures. I'm really excited to see uh, the new one by Angela Tus uh, by the indigenous artist. And uh, but I have to say, Aaron Spengler is a friend of my brother, and my family, and I really love to go sure. see one of his works at the at the sculpture garden. All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Fry, Mayor Fry. I like the blue rooster. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was a quick answer. A.J. Awed, what is your favorite sculpture at the Minneapolis, Minneapolis Sculpture Garden? Yeah, I would have to probably agree with the uh, current mayor there. <laughs> the rooster is mine. Two votes yeah. for, the, for the blue rooster. All right, Sheila Najad. I'm gonna go classic, cherry in the spoon. All right, great answers, all of you. Thank you so much for those questions. Now let's go to Caroline for some questions from our viewers. We asked the community to share their questions, and the first one comes from Yana in Minneapolis. Her question is, how will your plan to address the housing shortage reflect the reality that many people, especially black people, indigenous people, and people of color do not have enough income to buy a home? Mayor Fry, you're up first. You have one minute to respond, please. When I took office, we stated that housing was a right. And we didn't just talk about it, we acted, uh, providing record amounts of funding to affordable housing. In fact, about three times the previous record and more than almost any city in the entire country on a per capita basis. We started a uh, now nationally renowned and award-winning stable home, stable schools program, which specifically enables our kids 95% are, are whom of color to have homes within a certain radius of their school itself. And in the area of home ownership, we made that one of the four key pillars of our housing agenda, recognizing that one of the best ways to, to build intergenerational wealth that the black community has traditionally been deprived of is through home ownership. So we haven't just been talking about this. I would put our record up against any other mayor in the entire country. We have done the work. It's pumped complex, it's nuanced, and it requires you to dig in. AJ Awed, you're next. What will you do about affordable housing in the city? You have one minute. Yeah, so this is indeed a very complicated and complex issue. Uh, for me, I think there has to be a whole host of things and it has to be a holistic approach. One of my biggest advocations is for a, a, a luxury tax on 100% AMI rentals. That means all the buildings that are going up right now should be, you know, putting in the tax base. Hopefully that would generate revenue to incentivize more development of public housing. I'm not too big of a fan of affordable housing. And for me, when we're really t talking about uh, uh, BIPOC communities, working class individuals, Individuals. Uh, public housing is really the, the best way and the only reasonable affordable housing way. Uh, but outside of that issue, education is very important to, I would say, black home ownership as well and the younger generation, making sure that they have the proper tools and investments in that, making sure that they're well rehearsed in how the housing market works and the financial literacy goes up and making under, making sure that we also open up capital to communities of color and make sure to uh, co-sign for them. And, and that's really what I would be looking to do as a holistic approach to answer answering that issue. Sheila Najad, your answer, please. Absolutely. So this is one of the top issues of the campaign. One of the things I hear most frequently from people at the door is saying that they can't afford to live in Minneapolis right now, whether it's renting or buying a home. That's why I have always been a supporter of rent control, a supporter of tenant opportunity to purchase so that when landlords are going to sell their homes, those who live in the homes get the first opportunity to buy them. Expanding uh, investment in the land trust and also expanding offering low interest loans to homeowners and business owners to make sure that our BIPOC owned businesses are not displaced through gentrification. And that's really what it boils down to is Gentrification is making Minneapolis unlivable for mm -hmm. folks of color, for working class people across the city. Thank you. Kate Knuth, your answer, please, in one minute. Yes, thank you for this question. You know, housing is definitely a human right. It is even more a foundation for safety and stability for families and neighborhoods. And I have a comprehensive housing plan that focuses on building more housing, more affordable housing, and more deeply affordable housing, including creating a, a public housing levy to make sure we are investing in the most deeply affordable housing. I also do support rent stabilization in the ways I talked about earlier. But, you know, you're specifically talking about home ownership here, and that means that that requires us 
to do education, to help with capital costs, to look at ownership models of things other than single family homes, whether it's duplex or triplex as a way for generational wealth building as part of that ownership model, looking at the land trust to have more deeply affordable, um, investing more in deeply affordable approaches to home ownership. You know, I think it's a time where we need to get creative about how to partner with both the stability of house the stability of housing for black and brown and indigenous people as well as the ability to build wealth through ownership. This next question is from Ivy who is also in Minneapolis. She asks if ballot question 2 is passed, how will you ensure a smooth transition that supports the choice of Minneapolis voters? Mayor Fry, you go first again in this section. You have 1 minute to respond. How would you ensure a smooth transition if the police amendment passes? Well, I've made clear already that I am opposed to question two. Uh, I believe we need safety beyond policing because uh, not every 911 call requires response from an officer with a gun like mental health responders and social workers. Uh, and simultaneously, we need police. Uh, but the main reason I'm against this ballot measure is because it would have the head of the department report to 14 different people. Now, that being said, if this ballot initiative passes, I abide by the will of the voters. I will do everything possible to make sure that it works, to make sure that we have both accountability and safety in the city. And by the way, we've already started down that route to make sure that regardless of the outcome of this election, our city is protected, we're safe, and we're moving in the right direction collectively. Mr. Awed, your answer in 60 seconds, please. Yeah, um, so I, I hope that it doesn't pass and I'm urging all voters to vote against it. Uh, but in the case that it does pass, I mean, I think that we would have had missed our opportunity to really inject real trust in the new department, uh, but we would be working towards that. I would make sure to really try to center communities' voices to build that bridge between the new Department of Public Safety uh, and communities at large, but in particular, particular the black and brown communities of the city, uh, but also to make sure that we set precedents to work really hard that we do have an adequate size of police force in the city of Minneapolis. As you know, that amendment, if it passes, would remove that current language in our charter. So that's going to have to have, a, I would say, rigorous conversations, and hopefully we can set the precedent and culture not to play political football with how many officers we have in the city of Minneapolis. Sheila Najad, your answer, please. As I stated, I am fully in support of question two. In fact, I helped write it. So of course I have a plan for its transition. When question two passes as mayor, I will work with the council and the people of Minneapolis to scale up solutions. So that means maintaining fully funded 911 and 311 and expanding what we already have that we know works. So thanks to the work of my colleagues and I, we got mental health responder teams in the city of Minneapolis, but we only got enough funding for four people. So when we get this new department, we're going to scale that up. So when someone needs help and they're afraid to call police, they have a mental health professional that they're able to call. Expanding sexual and domestic violence advocates and youth violence prevention specialists. We're gonna scale up what we know works while we develop more violence prevention strategies throughout the city. And Kate Knuth, you, um, your turn to answer this question. How do you ensure the smooth transition of the, the voters' wishes on that question? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as I hope, as I um, stated previously, I hope the voters pass Charter Amendment 2. And I have a really uh, clear path forward to how to make sure we implement it well. And, you know, I think I'm the strongest candidate here in terms of my experience and my skill of working in big public bureaucracies as a former state representative. I built and led a leadership program at the university. It was our city's first chief resilience officer. And I will bring that skill to make sure that we get the structure right, we get the leadership right, we get the culture right, we get the process right, and we're building trust with community while we do it. You know, I think this is actually one of the mayor's real weaknesses is the basic management of our city. We've seen significant turnover at the leadership level, including right now, I'm not even sure we have a head of our Department of Civil Rights or Office of Police Conduct Review. That's not, I think, a leadership we need to dig in and build a more effective, holistic public safety plan or public safety department that includes police moving forward. 
Thank you. Up next, we would like each of our candidates to reflect on what has happened in the last four years. Now, we have focused a great deal today on serious challenges in the city. Now to the three challengers. What do you think has gone well since Mayor, Mayor Fry took office? You have one minute for your answers for this round. We'll start with A.J. Awed. Was the question, what did the mayor do well? Yes, sir. What did the mayor do well in the last four years? Uh, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be running against the mayor if I thought he did well. Uh, so I'm sorry to say that, uh, Mayor Fry, but I mean, for me, I think we definitely need to get past that. I think we definitely need to get past the moments that we've had for the last four years. I remember the promises that were made. I think that communities were supposed to come together. We were supposed to be less divided of the city. Uh, we were supposed to be building trust uh, throughout the city's enterprise. And unfortunately, that's the metrics that I'm, I'm ranking and, and evaluating our current mayor. And I think he fell, fails on all measures. So um, for me, I think that we do need new leadership. Um, and that's that's where I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, sir. Sheila Najad, in the last four years, what has improved in Minneapolis? What has improved in Minneapolis? Well, I will have to say I've seen improvements in the seeds of safety beyond policing, thanks to the work of me and my colleagues. So in 2018, I helped create the Office of Violence Prevention. In 2019, we moved more money into violence prevention funding and community strategies for safety. And in the last year, we won those mental health responder teams. These are the seeds of change that we needed in the city. I also saw neighbors coming together to take care of one another at unprecedented levels after the pandemic and after the uprising. And that's what gives me hope that we can step into this historic moment and move towards justice instead of moving backwards. Thank you, Kate Knuth. What do you think has gone well during Mary Fry's term? You know, I think the foundation and the heart of Minneapolis is that we are a city full of people who love Minneapolis and are willing to dig in and do the work to make it better. And, you know, as we are moving into the final week of this campaign, I think a lot of people fear like feel like we've been asked to focus on fear and we're divided. And I, I think that's because we've been told to feel that way. Literally, how many all of Minneapolis mailers have come into your mailbox asking you to be scared, asking you to not step forward with courage? You know, as mayor, I'm going to ask us to tap in to what's best about Minneapolis, and that is that people love this city and are willing to work for our future together. And if we tap into that love, I think we are uniform, unified and not maintaining a status quo on public safety and policing. I think we are unified on creating a better Minneapolis for every person in it. We need a mayor who's gonna offer the leadership to help us tap into that unity and make real progress on justice and safety for every person in Minneapolis. Thank you so much. Jacob Fry, we assume that you as mayor would naturally want to share your accomplishments here. Take a few seconds to do that, but we'd also like you to tell our viewers what you wish had gone better in the last four years. You have one minute to respond, sir. Thank you, Reg. You know, I'm really proud of the investments that we have made in housing. We have fundamentally changed the way our city budgets for housing going forward for the permanency. That's a really important piece because I believe that everybody should have that opportunity and foundation from which they can rise and a home is so essential to it. And simultaneously, you know, we've had to make very hard and sometimes painful decisions over this last year. Uh, we've learned a lot of lessons. Uh, the lessons I've learned have made me a better mayor and hopefully a better person. And you use those lessons going forward. But through it all, I'll tell you, I've been consistent. I've told the truth and we've charted an honest and progressive path forward for our city. That is right now what you need in a mayor, because as you've seen, even on this debate, you're going to get hit from every single different side and you can't cave. You got to do what's right for the city of Minneapolis. That is the path that we've led. Thank you so much, Mayor Fry, and thank you all candidates. Now to our closing statements. Well, to conclude, we'd like each candidate to make a final pitch to Minneapolis voters. Ms. Najad, you will go first with your one minute closing statement. Thank you. So this year's election is about the future of public safety. And I have spent the last 10 years as an organizer and policy advocate 
working on public safety in the city of Minneapolis, including creating the Office of Violence Prevention. I'm also a queer woman, the daughter of an immigrant, and I've worked everywhere from kitchens to colleges. And that means as mayor, I'm going to fight for everyday people in Minneapolis because I know what it's like to be one. I'm running because accountability needs to come to our police department. I'm running for mayor because we need a champion for all the families and kids in Minneapolis. I'm running for mayor because I want to invest the most in our public safety, starting with our youth. I'm asking the voters of Minneapolis to please rank me number one on your public. Ms. Knuth, you now have one minute for your closing statement. You know, we have been through a lot in the last four years, especially the last year and a half, and we have felt what it feels like not to have strong, effective mayor leadership to help us do the work we need together and to navigate and chart our path forward. And honestly, it doesn't feel very good. And as we come down to the end of this election, there has been too much focus trying to, put, to, to ask us to lean into that fear and that division. And I think the people, all of Minneapolis, the chamber, the downtown council are asking us to do that, underestimate the people of Minneapolis because the people of Minneapolis have a deep love for our city and a huge commitment to charting a better path forward to a more just, a safer and a more resilient city. What we've been missing to help us tap into that unity is mayoral leadership that will ask us to dig deep and step forward boldly and with courage to make a Minneapolis that works better for every single person in it. And Mayor Fry, you can respond to that in your one minute closing statement. Thank you, Reg. Esme and Caroline and everyone at WCCO who's helped put this debate together. Uh, we have been through uh, two years of unprecedented progress followed by two years of unprecedented challenge. Uh, and through it all, we've been straightforward with people. Uh, we've made sure to chart that honest and consistent path. And let's be clear, we've also gotten a lot of great things done. And that's everything from establishing record setting investments in affordable housing to immediately firing the officers involved in George Floyd's murder to pushing back on calls to defund the police. Unlike the other candidates in this debate, my position on that has not wavered an inch. Has it been a hard couple of years? Absolutely it has, but I'm committed to leading an inclusive recovery, to getting through this together. I'm committed to telling you the truth, regardless of which way the political winds blow. This city doesn't quit, and neither do I. And Mr. Awet, it is now your turn. You have one minute for your closing statement. Yeah, thank you very much, WCC, for hosting the debate. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking to more voters. And honestly, Minneapolis, you heard it here live today. We really do need new leadership. We've had a consistent mold of leadership in the city that continues to make promises and then break them. Leadership is not about experience of the state legislator. It's not about being a policy wonk. It's about actually leading and making sure communities are actually getting what they want and their voices are being heard and valid. I've been consistent on that throughout the campaign, and I'm the only candidate that's honestly saying to everybody in Minneapolis, let's just take a pause and, not, and look past the dichotomy of either yes for Minneapolis or Jacob has to come back. I think there's a third option, and that lays right here with AJ Awet's campaign, and I would be honored to lead the city of Minneapolis to a better future where we all do have dignified policing for all communities and we all prosper. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Alwed. Well, we are over our time for today, just barely though. We want to thank each candidate for participating in this debate on CBS and Minnesota. And of course, thank you to Reg and Caroline. We will be live here on CBS and Minnesota and WCCO TV on election night with results starting at 8 p.m. We have also invited all candidates for mayor to send us videos answering key questions. We'll be posting them and information on other races and issues at WCCO.com slash election throughout this week. In the meantime, we hope you found this debate informative. I'm Esme Murphy. Thank you so much for watching.